Hello, this is your Professor Ann Babson. Um, I am um, giving you a little more background information specifically about Marie de France and her relationship to the Arthurian tradition. Um, there is a little overlap between the video I made standing at a whiteboard in a black and white checkered shirt that you probably watched just a few minutes ago and this, and I apologize for the overlap. Perhaps this will help you remember things better. Uh, in any case, um, I think she is an interesting figure and the very fact that we have her recorded as an author, um, quite possibly uh, the first attributable author in English who is a woman, um, we have poems that like the wife's lament, which suggests that a woman was contributing uh, to a folk tradition as women did throughout the world uh, in pre-literate cultures and in early literate cultures. Nevertheless, Marie de France is remembered as uh, quite possibly the first female British author. And we're gonna talk a bit about that. So here we are, Marie de France, and here is what we assume may in fact be a picture of her. This really may be her. Um, it's an, an illuminated manuscript. It certainly looks as if people imagined her to be this way. And we're gonna talk about the Arthurian romance in Anglo-Norman literature. Uh, first, uh, let's talk about uh, where she wrote and in what she wrote. Um, Marie de France was a woman of some privilege living during the 12th century in England. She's not an Anglo-Saxon writer. Um, she's not Anglo-Saxon as her name suggests. She is from France. Um, she's a part of the court of England, possibly the half sister of King Henry II. Um, they don't know that for sure, but she is part of an Anglo-Norman court. I'll get into what that means in a minute, because there is a huge political shift in 1066 AD from the Anglo-Saxon era into the Anglo-Norman era. Um, and the language materially changes, uh, as I believe you have seen in my discussion of speaking English. Uh, and the language of the court when Marie de France lived there was neither English as we know it, uh, nor Anglo-Saxon, which we've been talking about, but instead they spoke a precursor of both modern French and of modern English, Anglo-Norman, a dialect of old French. Um, and the Normans invaded England and took it over for quite a few years, centuries. Uh, and this was a major upheaval. There were still people talking in Anglo-Saxon English, Old English, um, for some centuries afterwards, but they did not have power in government. Um, this is a, a picture uh, that's a detail of the Bayeux Tapestry. The Bayeux Tapestry is um, the chief historical record we have of contemporary perceptions of the Norman invasion of England under William the Conqueror in 1066 AD. Um, and I, here I tell you it's worth noting that a woman commissioned the production of this tapestry and given that needlework has always been within European tradition, the purview of women, uh, women made this. Women said we ought to have it and women made it and it is the chief document. It isn't a written scroll or codex, it is a tapestry that communicates the events of uh, the invasion um, of of England by the Normans. Um, Marie de France um, comes to, to England two generations after the establishment of the Norman court in England. Um, and in historical records and 
we have a woman author. What was the attitude toward women in the Norman court? Here's what I say. Um, attitudes uh, were a mixed bag toward women. On one hand, the church had firmly established the fault of the fall of humanity uh, from grace uh, in the hands of Eve. Uh, Eve ate the apple uh, first, or the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil first. And this is a fundamental problem for Christianity into the early 20th century in some schools of thinking. Um, uh, basically, if you read the original text, Adam and Eve both sin. And the Bible itself talks about the sin of Adam being uh, superseded by the sin of Christ. Um, and, but in this era, uh, it was all Eve's fault as far as the men of the church were concerned, the ones who taught f things from the Bible to an illiterate population that could not evaluate the Bible for themselves, uh, which meant that if two men committed a robbery, yes, those men should go to jail, but ultimately the fault laid at the, it was laid at the the foot of womankind because women ate the apple and every woman bore as a consequence of it the the curse of eve which was understood to be pain and childbearing but also to have a worse character than men fundamentally uh contemporary theologians contemporary preachers tend not to think this at all um and thank god and um there were even medieval scholars who thought that once you have the blood of Jesus, uh, uh, sin is washed away, not for just for men, but for women as well. Um, so, but women in the Anglo-Norman court are thought of as essentially secret agents of the devil, like all women were in the eyes of the church. But on the other hand, the Normans had a tradition of noble women sometimes participating in government, often in the form of a regency for an infant king. There was also a civil war prior to the elevation of Henry, where Henry's uh, um, uh, uh, relative Queen Maud, uh, as she was called, was trying to take over the government because her father said, I want her to be in charge. But the brother said, uh-uh, we're not doing that. We're not letting the girl be in charge. And there was a, a very vicious civil war. And the compromise was that Henry uh, could be king. Um, so uh, Queen Maud um, did not succeed in ruling England. However, um, there had been a very open attitude toward women. Women could inherit land and titles uh, when the males of their lineage were all deceased. And um, Henry II, the half brother potentially of, um, of, of Marie de France, married one of the most outspoken and interesting women of all European history, Eleanor of Aquitaine, who decided, for instance, to go on the Crusades like Am with other women in an Amazon style, where she was essentially topless with her ladies. And um, she orchestrates a divorce uh, from her husband that bores her so she can marry King Henry II. And then when King Henry II doesn't let her have, in her view, a sufficient say over the government, she basically pits her son against the f uh, uh, against her husband to enact a civil war in order for her to rule effectively as a regent. She is incredibly smart, incredibly pa determined. Um, surely a diva if ever there was one uh, and, and she is reviled by Henry II he is so mad at his his estranged wife he has her thrown under house arrest in a castle like we should all get to go to that house arrest nevertheless he realizes how close he was to losing his power because of his estranged wife and he is really mad at women in general. Um, Marie de France lives in this world where there is tension 
and also some acknowledgement of women's uh, capacity to, um, to, to, to reason and to think, but also a distrust of them as fundamentally evil because of Eve. Um, I wanted to give you, uh, again, we've been talking a bit about um, original languages. This is the beginning of um, L'Enval. L'aventure d'un autre lait qui me l'avait vu qu'une terrain fait fu d'un mu gentil vassal en bretant l'appel L'Enval. À Cardoel sur Juno l'irait, Arthur les pure et les curtés, pure les sescos et pure les pies qui détruit le pays. À la terre de Loingre, entrône, entrône, excuse me, ému suivant la dame à joine. Et la pente, à la pente custe en esté, il y avait des rails surjournés. Um, it's this told in a sing-songy folk tale style. All the lays that are in your book that you can see in the original have this quality of rhyming folktale. Um, uh, they are part of a tradition known as the lay, that is a tradition of a rhymed narrative poem that comes from Brittany, um, which is in northern France, an area next to where the Normans came from. Um, and uh, they tell this kind of story. Um, L'Enval is part of the tradition of Arthurian romances. Uh, we've, uh, the, my previous lecture talked to you about the idea of there being a lengthy tale told of knights, um, and they are about noblemen and have allegorical and magical characters in them. Um, the term allegory, uh, I, everyone in America knows of an allegory. Uh, the Statue of Liberty is an allegorical figure. Um, let me explain. Liberty is not something you can literally see. Liberty is not a person. Liberty is um, something we feel we understand. And the representation of liberty as a lady is a way to express an understanding of what liberty is. That's true too for blindfolded justice holding the scales on top of many courthouses in our country. She too is an allegorical figure. There are allegorical figures throughout the legends of Arthur um, and they represent things that they are that are not actually part of the visible world and there are many instances of magic. We see magical figures, for instance, where we have a werewolf. Um, let's talk about the origins of Arthur. Um, he is mentioned as a warrior general in a number of Welsh and Latin language texts from the 6th century onward, but it's unclear if he was a legend, I've talked about that before, or a historical figure of any kind. Um, we see in a book called Historia Reg Regum Britannae um, by Geoffrey of Monmouth, um, a text that accounts for what the legends say about Arthur, but he does not include the infidelity of Queen Guinevere with Lancelot. And the Queen's infidelity doesn't appear until Chrétien de Troyes writes about uh, them uh, almost a century later. Um, and, and we have to assume that some attitude toward women has shifted during this time. Um, it's typical of all Arthurian narratives that the author feels free to adapt the story to discuss political issues contemporary to the author rather than to Arthur. Um, in her doing uh, the work in L'Enval, we must assume that Marie de France did this as well. And she seems to have some things to say about women's agency. Um, we have a variety of characters who appear. You'll see the, some of these um, in the works of both the Gowan poet, who we're going to read, and in Marie de France. We have, of course, King Arthur, 
Guinevere his wife, Sir Gawain who is brave, Sir Galahad who is chaste, Sir Lancelot with whom the queen falls in love, uh, Merlin who is the magician and counselor to Arthur, and Morgana Le Fay who is a sorceress. I mentioned all of this in my other Specifically in L'Enval, um, Arthur's tale is adapted by Marie de France, and fairy women like women appear out of nowhere in a variety of medieval romances. Again, not meaning romantic stories, but tales. But it's rare for a knight to get rescued by a damsel rather than a damsel getting rescued by a knight. You will notice that the rescuer who rides to the rescue of the central figure is not a knight. The knight gets rescued by his fairy uh, lover. And uh, the proposition that Lancelot uh, normally gets is given to L'Enval. And there are some similarities in L'Enval's situation with the queen and Joseph's situation with Potiphar's wife in Genesis. Um, you may recall in the story of Joseph, uh, he is slave to a man named Potiphar in Egypt, and the wife of Potiphar makes a pass at Joseph, who refuses to um, have sex with her, and because of that, she maligns him and says he tried to rape her, and he's thrown in jail. Um, the fact that the text of Marie de France echoes the story from uh the, the Old Testament means that Marie de France was at least acquainted with stories and quite probably um, was able to read in Latin uh, the book of Genesis. It would not have been un uh, unthinkable that a woman would have access to that in King Henry's court. Uh, the queen is not disgraced in the end, only proven wrong, which is interesting. Um, if Marie de France wanted to say that, that uh, adulterous women were bad, she probably would have written other kinds of stories. There's a whole lot of adultery in Marie de France's stories, um, and people are unhappy in their arranged marriages, and they seem to um, try to have a better romantic relationship with somebody else to limited degrees of success. Her, her love stories are not happy ones, but she is not prepared to condemn in this story Queen um, Guinevere, which is worth noting. She often writes about star-crossed lovers. Nobody's happy in her romances. Um, she writes love poems in French and they're all about the pain of love. Her stories are about unhappy married women and the lovers they attempt to have. Attempt is the operative word here. Um, it may be a semi-autobiographical account of her own sad marriage. Um, sadly, we're not reading the Canterbury Tales. I would love to just park the car here, but we have a survey of all of British literature to go through. We're going to read Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. You will see infidelity is a continued theme in the works of um, the late Middle Ages there, but we're not specifically reading.